I'm going to talk to the one person who might be able to analyze my neurosis. Dr. Peter Lowenberg, historian, psychoanalyst, and my father. Yeah, well, Adolf Hitler came to power on January 30th, 1933. This is the first time he's been back to Hangzhou since he was a little boy in the 1930s. We've decided to move our little reunion to Shanghai to try and find my family's old apartment and see who, if anybody, still lives there. This is the building, Dad. It's back in... 244. This is it. My grandparents left Germany and moved into this place in 1933, when my dad was less than a year old. The building is still standing, but we wonder, is anyone who remembers the Jews of Shanghai still standing? Father <laughs> Tuesday. 89. He's showing me where all the Jews uh, lived. These weren't Jews, yeah, those were Jews. Uh, In there were Jews. That's the Jews. Jews. Uh, this boutique owner is nice enough to get on the horn and ask her neighbor to come down. But before he does, she explains why he isn't the landlord anymore. Oh, it seems that Jewish refugees weren't the only people displaced by political upheaval in 20th century Shanghai. <laughs> As Mr. Yu checks out the snapshots my grandfather took so long ago, it makes me wonder how much the building has changed since my father lived here. It was bought with 10 bars of gold, this, this apartment. Oh. <laughs> no. Mr. Yu rifles through his scrapbooks, and we're surprised to find there are a few things he and my father have in common. What a tight hat! It's a German. Get this, Dad. Come here. Come here. I have something to tell you. His wife is German. Really? He this just is, told this is my Whoa! Mr. Yu met his wife in Shanghai, where she grew up. 
her Chinese father and German mother met in Berlin in 1937. The same year my German grandparents and my father were living in this building. Uh, but it was also that same year that the safe haven my grandparents had found within these walls began to crumble when the situation in Shanghai took a turn for the worse. In 1937, the Sino-Japanese, the Chinese-Japanese war started and the Japanese uh, naval and air forces uh, penetrated into Shanghai. They, they dominated the Yangtze River. There were bombings of the Chinese quarters of the city, including some bombs in the international settlement. We'd go up to the roof garden and the alarms would sound and you'd see these Japanese bombers, they were very slow. And you'd see, watch them drop their loads of bombs on the Chinese part of the city. And then thousands of refugees came pouring into the French concession. Uh, and there was a lot of violence. Fire brigade was always uh, running, trying to put out fires, and my parents decided to leave. They had booked passage to America on the President Hoover. And then after the war came to the Yangtze, uh, American president lines wasn't going to Shanghai anymore. The French organized a ceasefire on the Yangtze River and a evacuation of residents of the French concession. I remember the gunboat had an airplane in, on the front of it and a big cannon and this uh, little seaplane. And the Japanese flew over. It was a very scary uh, event. They, parents left with one suitcase each. And, uh, then the gunboat took us down the Wangpo River. I remember asking my dad if a Chinese soldier had his head cut off with a machine gun, could he still scream? I mean, that, to an analyst, is a castration fantasy. And then on the high seas, we were taken to a big French liner. Then they went to Hong Kong, and that port was closed then because of cholera, so we had to wait in Hong Kong till it was reopened and it was a 21-day passage up to Seattle. Was it easy to get into the U.S. at that time? Did they, how difficult was it for them to get their visas? And... They were on the German quota, which they got... German quota wasn't filled until 1939. My father's passport at the time bore Nazi insignia, and it was only because he was German, not because he was a Jew, that he was allowed entrance into the United States. There was no special provision for persecuted Jewish uh, refugees from Europe. Saying goodbye to Mr. Yu isn't easy, so we want to say thank you with a little bag of fruit. But that proves even more difficult. As my father returns to America and I return to Beijing, I can't help but wonder if perhaps one day my Chinese grandchildren will look back at the choices I made in life and love and marvel at how their family survived the burdens of history. <laughs>